Welcome back to the Locked On Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day listening to who? The always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, MillerThomas24.myportfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. If you want to see more content by me, just follow me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for my personal account. Or just look up Locked On Dimebacks on both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. And thank you for making Locked On Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be doing this podcast without you. It's free and available on all platforms, so please tell your friends. But what are we discussing on today's pod? Well, we got Locked On Giants host Ben Caspic on the pod today because we were dis- discussing that Buster Posey retirement, Kevin Gosman leaving, uh, is Chris Bryant coming back? We're also going to talk about some of the remaining top free agents still left on the market. So it's going to be a jam-packed pod, as always, with Ben Kaspik of Locked on Giants. But before we get to him and bring him on the pod, we got to play that fancy-ass intro. Intro, drop. You are Locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And as advertised, let's bring Ben Caspic of Locked On Giants on the podcast. Ben, come on down on the Locked On Back podcast for I don't know how many times you've been on here. You're one of the go-to regular guests, I guess, at this point of my podcasting Locked On Diamondbacks career. So, Ben, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Like I was saying before we went on, I'm excited to talk some baseball. There's been really nothing going on except these minor league signings. And uh, today we're going to talk a little more major league stuff. So looking forward to that. Yeah, how have you been able to get through your podcast recently? What kind of content have you been discussing with this lockout going on? There were some projections that came out up on fan graphs that we spent a few days talking about. And then, gosh, what did we even t- A lot of mailbags. I think the, okay. the, the, fa- the listeners have some good questions and always, you know, pertinent to what's going on with the team. And so it's a fun way to, like, you know, engage with what people are thinking about, but also engage with your your listeners so that's that's been a regular thing on our show anything you've been doing i can take some notes yeah uh, uh, yeah i might need to get a mailbag going i'm just always scared all the questions are just gonna be fake ones i created because no one's gonna send anything in so we'll see we'll maybe do a mailbag in the future but i've been doing kind of it's been kind of christmas week here on the locked on diamondbacks podcast i did like a 12 diamondbacks of christmas two-day podcast where I picked 12 D-backs players, just kind of said the gift they're bringing to the D-backs to help the team improve in 2022. And then I did like a Mike Hazen Christmas wish list of what he needs to go get after the lockout. So we've been trying to stick with the Christmas holiday theme here on the Locked on Dimebacks podcast, you know, just trying to make it through this lockout. But before the lockout, the Giants offseason, it's been pretty interesting, Ben Kaspik. And I kind of just want to ask you about that. We're going to go all over the Giants offseason. But so far, I just want to ask you, how are you feeling about the Giants offseason this point of the uh, lockout, I guess? At this point of the offseason, how are you feeling about the Giants? Well, it definitely feels incomplete. I If they went into the season and this was kind of the main, these were the main moves that they made and they don't make any other significant changes, then I would at that point be ready to say that it's been a disappointment because this is a, the offseason we've been circling as Giants fans for a long time with all these contracts coming off the books and so all this money theoretically available to spend, and they haven't really done that. They entered the offseason with only one starting pitcher kind of under contract for next year, and that was Logan Webb. Thankfully, Webb had like a breakout mm-hmm. season and kind of emerged in the second half and into the playoffs as like an ace. But so that's great. But then you only have one guy. So the fact that they've, they re-signed Anthony DiSclefani, they re-signed Alex Wood, and then they sign Alex Cobb, all of whom were signed to multi-year deals. It's a good start for me because it gives them, you know, four starters as opposed to one. But yeah, it ultimately does feel incomplete and they've lost some really big names. 
Yeah, it's still so early in the offseason. It's hard to give too much of a harsh critique on any of these teams of what they've done so far. I mean, the Giants have lost some people. The team like the Yankees haven't really made a move so far. But there's still so many big-time free agents on the market that we're going to be talking about later on this pod. And I want to talk a little bit about that rotation later, too. But I first want to start here, Ben Kaspik, because I felt like this was the first domino to the Giants offseason. And it was that Buster Posey retirement, which... To me, I felt like just came out of left field, honestly. Like, I didn't see any whispers or any reports during the season like, this could be Buster Posey's, Buster Posey's last year. Like, for you as the Locked On Giants guy, like, did you know this Posey retirement was coming? Were you surprised by it? Like, I, I was just honestly taken by left field from this retirement. Yeah, I had an idea that it was a possibility, and we talked about it a lot on the show. It kind of felt like in some ways that it couldn't happen because he's just been such a huge part of this team for so long. But uh, just knowing Posey and knowing how much of a family guy he is and what he's gone through kind of with injuries. And honestly, I'm trying to remember why exactly I really felt like it was a distinct possibility he would retire. Mm -hmm. A lot of it has to do with his contract was basically up. There was a club option for, uh, 2022 that was certain to be exercised, but it always felt to me like there was a chance he would retire. And he did. I mean, so not the Derek Jeter route of kind of having the send off and all the gifts yeah. and all that, the big but poppy. Uh, yeah, he, instead he, he announces after the season. So in some ways as a fan, you feel a little bit gypped, like you didn't get a chance to say a proper goodbye, but also it's his right, and that's just kind of his personality. He likes to be out of the spotlight, and that's part of why I felt like he might retire. He, As much as he loves baseball and winning, he also doesn't really want to be the center of attention. And so his career's over. I still kind of can't believe it, but what a career it was. Yeah, because this guy broke into the leagues in 2009, and we basically saw his whole career right before our eyes. One of the best catchers in baseball during his time, but... 2019, you, you say you have a feeling that, you know, during the season that he might have retired, but still 2019, he didn't play a ton, 114 games. So he did play a good amount, but wasn't the same bust supposedly that we've seen in recent years. Then he opted out of the 2020 season. And maybe you think there that maybe the end is on the horizon for Buster Posey. He's in the decline. It doesn't seem like the player, the same player physically, especially after some injuries he's dealt with in his career, but he comes back in 2021. And seriously, he, he was probably the best catcher, maybe next to Salvador Perez offensively in baseball this past season. He had a, a complete resurgence and revival of his career. That kind of made me, as part of the reason why I was so surprised as to why he was retiring because he's coming off an all-star appearance where he was deemed maybe the best catcher in baseball. And now he's just gone just like that. Do you think after a phenomenal season, like he just had it made it tougher for him to walk away from the game? Or is this something that you think was always pre-planned and preconceived and premeditated in his mind? Honestly, I think it in a weird way is the opposite. I think that he proved mm. okay. that he, he did not want to go out kind of, because nobody wanted him anymore and the fact that he was able to come out and just kind of prove to himself first and foremost and also prove to everybody else that he is still a great player and then beating the Dodgers for the first time in the division in so long the last time anyone had won it was the Giants in 2012 in the NL West so to set a record for wins for the franchise to have the season that he had to set a giants record for home runs to lead the league in home runs i just feel like i mean what else could he accomplish that's part of what my feeling was he's got three rings he's got an mvp he has a rookie of the year he's got multiple silver sluggers a gold glove multiple all-star appearances and then he's got this season where he led the team to the most wins in franchise history. They beat the Dodgers. You just can't do any better than that. And so why not kind of go out on top if you already feel like you've done everything you can possibly do? He's also disgustingly rich. So what more could he accomplish? And yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I see it. 
And going out on top, I think there's something kind of cool to that. And he played his whole career with one team, which was also something he wanted to do. So he, d- he did it all in his career. Yeah, I think the accomplishment that's going to stick out most for Busta Posey is that MVP award they just mentioned because catchers just don't win that award a lot. Like, you're not playing a full slate of games. Like, you're typically not playing 162 games if you're a catcher just because of the wear and tear. But he played, like, 150 games or something crazy during his MVP season. He, like, led the league in batting average, too. Like, he had such a... a expansive offensive game that you just don't typically see from catchers like Yadi is considered a pretty good catcher but still he was more of a contact hitter low power like he could get on base not strike out a ton but he wasn't giving you the 25 home runs that a Buster Posey was giving you with the 330 average and an OPS around 900 like Buster Posey's offensive game and repertoire was Just on a different level of most catchers that we've seen in modern baseball over the last 20 years, I think the last catcher to win an MVP before Buster Posey was Ivan Rodriguez Pudge in 1999. So it's not something that you see a lot. And I think that I think that MVP is going to be the thing that stands out the most from his fantastic career, because like you said, I know baseball, we don't value winning that much, but to win three rings is a ton. And I think that's a huge accomplishment for Buster Posey in his career. But do you think I know you're not the Hall of Fame guy? Ben and I think we all consider Buster Posey a Hall of Famer but do you think he's gonna be a first ballot Hall of Famer it's hard to say because I mean baseball writers I feel like we need to split the vote or something when it comes to MLB Hall of Fame voting because some of these ballots that are coming out they're absolutely terrible and they need to stay anonymous because uh, I, I don't know how you could put your name to some of these ballots that are dropping but do you consider Buster Posey a first ballot Hall of Famer that's a tough one I mean me mm-hmm. personally I would have no question in my mind to vote him as a hall of famer i think in general catchers are underrepresented and when you consider he was to me pretty clearly the best catcher in the game over the period that he played and how can you not be a first ballot hall of famer if you're the best at your position over a significant amount of time plus all the accolades that you don't necessarily have to have even if you're a great player like the the MVP, the the rings. I mean, he had everything to do with those World Series rings. They don't win a single one of them without him. How much more value could he possibly provide? And plus, defensively, he was a good defensive catcher, a good mm-hmm. framer, a good leader of a pitching staff. So I'm not sure if he'll be first ballot because some people have a question as a le- feel. Some people have legitimate questions as to whether or not he's a Hall of Famer. To me, oh, really? yeah, I've I've talked to people on this show, on my show, that aren't so sure, or at least it's more of a question. But uh, so I don't, I don't know. I'm not the Hall of Fame expert, but I hope so. But as long as he gets in, I think it'll be uh, celebrated here in the Bay Area. Yeah, that MLB Hall of Fame is just the weirdest because there's no like, baseline or standard if you're like oh this guy is really good and these guys are kind of comparable if that guy's already in the hall of fame then this guy has to be in the hall of fame too like you can't use simple logic when it comes to the mlb hall of fame voting like you just have to throw all that out but i feel like when you look at buster posey and just compare him to any catcher in the last 20 years like he pretty much stacks up if he's not better than all of them outside of like uh yadier molina's in the conversation and maybe a couple other dudes but Considering he's maybe the best catcher of the last 20 years since like a Ivan Rodriguez, I feel like he has to go in the Hall of Fame. But I want to ask you, Ben, how do you think that Giants, how do you think the Giants is going to replace his production? But before I hear your answer, one thing that I know Buster Posey was using every game to help his performance is his socks, Ben, because you need quality socks to be a quality performer. And I'm pretty sure Buster Posey loved to wear Stan socks because founded in 2009, Stan's apparel represents a radical reinvention of socks, underwear, and active apparel. With a sharp focus on comfort, quality, and creativity, Stan's brings in atypical aesthetic alongside of alongside pop culture's hottest collaborators for the ultimate in style and self-expression because everything you wear should be a direct extension of who you are and how you feel this christmas i'm asking my parents for a pair of stan socks ben are you gonna put a little stan socks in your christmas list this off season of course and they have baseball themed socks so heck yes yeah and if you want to go get some socks and put them in your cart just use that promo code locked on at checkout to apply your promo code. Enjoy the color and comfort of a life less ordinary with stance. Now, Ben Caspic, back to the locked on Dimebacks times locked on Giants crossover because I was going to ask you, Ben, 
How do you think Buster Posey's production get replaced in that lineup? Because uh, we're going to talk about Chris Bryant here pretty soon about him potentially leaving too. Like that's a big bat in your order to be missing. He's been one of the most consistent offensive players, you know, you could say outside of even catcher in baseball over, you know, his peak period. So how do the Giants expect to replace a guy like him, not only in their lineup, but also behind the plate too? Well, it helps that they do have one of the better catching prospects in the game in Joey Bart. But on okay. the flip side of that, uh, he Joey Bart, when Posey opted out, po, uh, Bart played a lot in 2020, and it was a disaster. I mean, he didn't. He played terribly. He didn't hit, and he he had trouble even like catching the baseball as a catcher. And so, there's no guarantee that a prospect is going to come in and have success. And so, I don't think they're expecting Bart to just come in and and fill the void left by Posey seamlessly. But it does help to at least have a guy who could be really good kind of step in next. But they'll have to replace it in, you know, the aggregate. They'll have to – I don't think you're just going to – there's no superstar catcher to just go out there and acquire to fill that void. I mean, like you mentioned with Chris Bryant as well, yeah, it's a couple of big-time producers in the middle of that lineup gone. And – Bryant is still a free agent. There are other players out there who are available. But, I mean, the one thing that I'll say is that in 2020, even with Posey opting out, no Chris Bryant yet, and Joey Bart playing a lot and struggling, the Giants still had a very good offensive season in 2020, even though it was a short year. But they scored the eighth most runs in baseball that year. So I think that they're, like, deep enough through the rest of their roster to be able to still be productive but at, at at the same time there's just no question that it's a big drop off i mean despite that they they didn't have a lot of success in 2020 they were a little bit under 500 and this year they won 107 games so if you want to get back to being like a 90 plus win team or 95 plus win team they've got work to do do you think the giants despite his poor play in 2020 they're going to ride Joey Bart as a full-time catcher in 2021 or could you see them maybe going out and getting at least a platoon guy to you know maybe take half the workload off his plate so it doesn't have to be all Joey Bart trying to replace Buster Posey's production well they've got Kurt Casale under club control Casale was the uh, backup so to speak for Posey this year and man they had a ton of success when Casale was in the lineup I don't know if that's just kind of a random a uh, fluky thing, but they were like 42 and 12 in starts by Casale, something crazy like that. He is really good defensively and a good kind of leader of a pitching staff. So it's nice to have Casale around. But if it's just Bart and Casale, I think there's the potential for disaster because Casale is not much of a hitter. And then if Bart struggles, what do you do? you got to send Bart down and then you only have Kurt Casale. So yes, I think they need to find a way to bring somebody in who's like got a major league track record and can fill in in case Bart and Casale, that duo just, I mean, Joey Bart, if it's just Bart and Casale, they've got to give the opportunities to Bart because mm -hmm. of the upside and the chance that he could become really good. You can't just have him sitting on the bench, but if he struggles, I think he needs to get sent down, not just sit on the bench where he's not even developing or playing so it's a it's kind of a head scratcher. I've been trying to speaking of what we've been talking about with the lockout. I spent a lot of time talking about how are the Giants going to figure out the catcher position. They went from being like arguably in the best position of any yeah. team to now arguably being in one of the worst positions. But again, Bart gives them hope that maybe I mean Bart yeah, he's got a ton of power. He, the scouting report is that he's a good defender and he's a big bodied catcher. He kind of gets down low and he frames well and he can block really well. He's got a great arm. So he was the number two overall pick in 2018. So he's a, he's been a top prospect, but it's just a matter of, I mean, as you know, they don't always pan out. So, mm -hmm. and we saw it in 2020. So yeah, I don't know exactly what's going to happen.
And I think catcher just one of those positions that probably have a bigger learning curve learning curve than other positions in baseball just because you have to worry about their pitcher. You have to know all his pitching mechanics and what he likes to throw and all his spots, you know, in the strike zone. And then you got to be good at the plate yourself and know the other pitcher scouting report. So when you go against them, like there's just so much information you have to take in as a catcher. I just think there's a larger learning curve there than maybe other positions around the diamond. But I would probably just give Bart – uh, some time, be patient with him because a guy like Dalton Varsha, one of the top prospects for the D-backs, who is also a catcher, like he didn't look good his first two years. He didn't look good this past season, at least in the first half. And then the second half of this 2020 season, he took off. He had a monster second half of the season. Now all D-backs fans are like, whoa, this guy Dalton Varsha might be the real deal. He might be the X factor in the NL West, at least for this D-backs team, maybe to you know the difference between 65 and 68 wins for this team next season. So we'll see how Dalton Varsha fares out. But Buster Posey wasn't the only guy who left the Giants this offseason, Ben. Kevin Gosman seemed to be like, you know, the diamond in the rough that the Giants discover. They signed him to a one-year little minor league deal. They're like, oh, we're bringing in Kevin Gosman, former top prospect from the Orioles. This is an under-the-radar move. And all of a sudden, he kind of turns into a Cy Young candidate out of nowhere. But the Giants just kind of let him walk and go to Toronto, who let Robbie Ray walk, who let Robbie Ray walk, and they just replaced him with a Kevin Gosman. So, why did the Giants do it? Was it money? Was it the second half performance? Like, why did the Giants let this guy who they discovered out of nowhere, who turned into basically their frontline starter, just walk for nothing in free agency? I'm not entirely sure, but <laughs> okay. what I do know, like the yeah, they haven't. <laughs> they haven't given an explanation. I mean, they, that's one of the frustrating things about covering a baseball team is they never give explanations for anything like this, commenting on specific players. So we're we're only left to speculate. But there were some red flags in the second half of the season. He really did struggle, and he couldn't locate either of his pitches where he wanted to, and the second half wasn't nearly as good as the first. And then in the playoffs, we, that that those issues kind of showed up again in his – one start but at the same time i think they view him as a really really good pitcher i think he is a really really good pitcher i would just say that it's probably farhan zaidi's uh natural what's the word he's he's he does not want to give out long-term deals to pitchers i think because historically a lot of those deals do not work out well and so when you're talking five years, when you're talking 100 million plus, I just think it probably has to be a really, really special arm, which maybe Kevin Gosman is, uh, for them to want to take on that risk. Because five years is a long time. I went back and I looked at some of the top starters per MLB trade rumors. I know we're going to look at that later mm -hmm. uh, in terms of MLB trade rumors ranking uh, players. If you look at five years ago, the top starting pitchers, it is shocking to think that those guys were considered the best options at that position at that time. It just goes to show you how long five years really is. It was names. I mean, I know the names, but it's it's just crazy. I would recommend anyone <laughs> who's interested to yeah. go check that out. And even four years ago. Name? Yeah, I have it written down somewhere. If you give me a second, I, I'm trying to remember. Let's see. No Stall words. for me yeah, for one second. <laughs> yeah, cause I would love to find that out because, yeah, I mean, five years is a pretty long time. I'm not even sure. Five years ago was, what, 2016? That was pretty much the last good year of life, 2016. Music was popping <laughs> pre-pandemic. 2016 was like peak of life for me and good for a times. lot of people I know, at least in this generation. Yes. Um, okay, I found it. The top five were Jeremy Hellickson, number one. <laughs> oh, my God. Yvonne Nova, number two. Oh, my Lord. You Rich Hill, like number three, which still that going. one ended up being good. That was a Dodger. The Dodgers ultimately signed him, and, and he, was he like did well there. 39 at that time, probably. Yeah, <laughs> still going now. Uh, Jason Hamill, number four, and oh Andrew Kashner, number five. Jesus. Admittedly, Christ. it was a weak starting pitcher class. They didn't have any of them as like 100 million plus, but they've Stop. got most of them in the 50 plus million dollar range, and none of those deals except. Uh, for Rich Hill, who did pitch pretty well, none of them were even close to being top starting pitchers. And then it doesn't get much better if you look at four years ago, three years ago, two years ago. Even Madison Bumgarner shows up on the on the list from two years ago. Yikes! And 
you know, Steven Strasberg, whose arm blew out like immediately. So there's a lot of lessons of, I mean, Madison Bumgarner, D-backs fans know full, full mm. well how a starter's value can just plummet overnight. And so I think that that's part of it is just a risk aversion with, with long-term deals for starters. Yeah. And I'm also guessing like probably Hamill and, Rich Hill, probably the only two guys you just mentioned that were probably over the age of 30 as well. I'm guessing Nova and I'm guessing Jeremy Hellickson was only like 25 or 26 at the time. Like, I feel like he was probably pretty young at the time as well. So that that just adds to the hysteria of it that these guys were probably in their primes, you know, probably considered the peak of their careers. And they still five years later couldn't live up to any deal that they probably got at the time so yeah the the five-year deals for pitchers or probably players in general can always be risky I think you probably want to go younger I mean we see a lot of these deals now coming for these young superstars like a Wander Franco before they even hit arbitration like I just lock these guys up and if we could get it below market value uh might as well do it so that's pretty interesting that you bring that up I'm definitely gonna have to do some research on these five-year deals for some of these pitchers but If you were the GM of the Giants, Ben, do you think the second half of Kevin Gosman's season last year would have made you hesitant enough to not give him that five-year contract? Or did you see enough from him his two seasons in San Fran that you're like, oh, you know what? I actually think Gosman's worth that five-year, $100 million deal. It's a tough question. I mean, me personally, I, I wanted them to bring back Kevin Gosman, but I also understand the risk aversion. And partially too with Kevin Gosman. He is a two pitch guy. He, he has a slider that he rarely throws and it's not a great pitch. He's fastball splitter and it's a good mix. I mean, when he's right, he can dominate with those two pitches, but two pitches makes me nervous five years down the road. Like any number of things can go wrong there, but I mean, that there's a reason I'm not a GM, you know, I might think <laughs> that I would make great decisions, but it, just looking back at that, those guys five years ago, it it does tell you something because I probably, you know, people probably really wanted their team to sign Jeremy Hellickson and Ivan Nova to these four MLB trade rumors predicted four year deals for each of those guys. And neither of those guys should have even been signed to a one year deal if we go back and look at what the production was like the next year. So the the two pitch thing does it is a little bit of a red flag, especially because he just could not make it work mostly in the second half of the year. Yeah, that's interesting. You bring up the two pitch thing because that's been kind of my issue with Luke Weaver the last year and a half plus because he was a guy when he first came to Arizona that threw four pitches, fastball, cutter, change up curveball. But in 2021, he's basically just been fastball changeup. He threw that over 90% of the time, man. That just makes me feel like he can't really be a frontline starter if you're just throwing two pitches. Like, I feel like that's not really sustainable. It feels like you become too predictable if it's like, all right, if I see the fastball seven straight times, is he, the next pitch is either going to be another fastball or it's going to be a changeup. Like, <laughs> you can't, it's hard to fool hitters if you're only throwing one or the other. So, I, I think, I, I think trying to trust a pitcher who only throws two pitches coming from a guy that has to watch a pitcher and try to believe in a pitcher that he could turn to a frontline starter, even though he only has two pitches that does make me very wary. So I can't fault the giants front office for not, you know, signing a guy to a mega contract. If he doesn't seem like he has the repertoire to live up to that contract over the long haul. Like it, it, I think it was probably now that you really illustrate you know, that he is a two pitch guy. I think it probably was a smart move for the giants considering also we had like a seven year sample size of Kevin Gosman prior to San Francisco, where he just was mediocre at best. And then the second half of this past season, he kind of went back to being, uh, he's, he probably wasn't as bad as he was before San Francisco, but he definitely wasn't the guy we saw in the first half of the season. So maybe when you look at the larger body of work with a Kevin Gosman, you look at the two pitch sample size or the two pitch, uh, arsenal he has you look at his years prior to San Fran you look at the second half of last season and it's like there are a lot of red flags and indicators saying that maybe we shouldn't give this guy a big contract so we'll see with hindsight of course our opinions are going to change a year from now if Kevin Gosman goes on to have a season like Robbie Ray we're all going to be like damn we were pretty dumb about Kevin Gosman maybe we we should have resigned him but we'll cross that bridge when we get there but Ben I want to ask you who you could bet on in that Giants rotation after Kevin Gosman leaving? Uh, after Kevin Gosman leaving, but if you want to bet on anything, Ben, do you know where you have to go? Bet online. 
<laughs> yeah, you got to go to Bet Online because Bet Online has you covered all season. More props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues the march to the playoffs. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use your, just use our promo code LOCKDOWN to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. There's not a more awkward transition than this podcast when we try to do those live ad reads. I can never do a nice clean segue to a live ad read. It's always awkward and, and you know just frantic mostly. But let's get back on track here, Ben, and get back to the crossover. Because how much do you trust that Giants rotation after Kevin Gosman leaving? Because I have to be honest, Ben, I'm not sure if I'm in love with this Giants rotation. Of course, Logan Webb emerged in 2021. But can I trust that? Is that repeatable we'll see is that i guess repeatable is the best word we'll see in 2022 if that's you know if that's really the logan webb del scafani alex wood alex cobb they're all guys that are like solid number three guys in a rotation but they also have track records where some years they're good and some years they're not too good so how are you feeling about this giant rotation after kevin gosman leaving i feel okay about it i mean part of that is that Initially, like I said, it was just one guy, even though that one guy is, you know, a 25-year-old Webb who emerged in a huge way in, in the regular season and in the playoffs when he dominated the Dodgers a couple of different times. So just to have four starters is is a relief in a lot of ways, but there is risk with with all of the three that they brought in. And with Wood and Cobb, there they've had a lot of injury. His, uh, in their careers. But I think that each and every guy is is a good pitcher. And so you've got four good starting pitchers right now. And I do think Logan Webb showed me enough to believe that he's probably going to be a front of the rotation type arm moving forward. Perhaps that's unwise, but I mean, he was just, his um, his development was incredible to witness firsthand. He went I forget what it is now. I think 14 or 15 straight starts in the middle of the season with three runs or fewer. Mm. I know uh, D-backs fans know about that with oh, Zach yeah. Gallen. And the consistency was incredible. And then the way he pitched in the postseason, I don't want to put too much stock into that, but it was the powerhouse Dodgers, and he completely overpowered them. And so I do view him now as a guy – I'm not saying he's like a top 10 pitcher in the game – but I think a uh, top 25 pitcher in the game and with, with a lot of upside with strikeout potential with ground ball, not just potential, he's one of the most elite ground ball pitchers in the game. And so that's a good formula, especially in San Francisco where it's already hard to hit the ball out of the ballpark. So I, I'm really high on Logan Webb, who's just 25, like I said. And then the rest of the guys are solid. I just think they need... I would like them to sign Carlos... Rodon because yeah. of the year that he just had. I mean, the year that he just had as dominant as Webb was Rodon was even on another level and there's injury concern. He, he didn't pitch deep into games at all. in, in the second, in the last couple months of the year, and then uh, his velocity was in decline a little bit, but then his velocity was up in the playoffs, but then the White Sox didn't give him the qualifying offer. And that was really weird. And so, there's injury concern with Rodon as well. But yeah, I think that if they can stay healthy, it's it's a solid four in the rotation. And you're losing Cueto. Uh, to me, Cobb is like the Cueto replacement. And to me, that's an upgrade. So you've simply lost Gosman, which is a big loss. But can you replace it with a guy like Rodon? Maybe. So it's a work in progress is what I'll say. Yeah, Rodon is someone I talked a little bit on my own podcast because he seems like he's going to be the guy that a lot of teams go after because I don't think he's going to be breaking the bank because he does seem like a guy with a lot of red flags and I don't think anyone's going to give him a mega contract. But I think there's going to be a lot of suitors for him because he could be that high risk high reward guy that pays off for you, you know, big time. He could be a Cy Young candidate. He could be next year's Robbie Ray in the right situation. So I think Rondone is someone that's going to have a lot of suitors, but I don't think he's going to be breaking the bank wherever he goes. And 
when you talk about Logan Webb in the playoffs, like Ben, you should probably put more stock into that than any other star he had because, like you said, he went against the villains, the Dodgers, the the baddest team in baseball, and he absolutely dominated in the postseason. And I know baseball fans don't care about the playoffs and they don't care about winning, but no stage is bigger than the postseason. And we've seen historically great pitchers, <clears throat> Clayton Kershaw, struggle on the biggest stages. And so if you have a guy who's a stud in the regular season and gets better in the playoffs, to me, that's even more valuable than doing the reverse and being the anti clean, uh, being, being the clean Kershaw. So I actually respect Logan Webb more if he is a really high level starter in the regular season and then a, an elite ace in the postseason. Like that's what I want from my players. I want them to go up a level when the game gets tougher. So I, I think Logan Webb is definitely the guy I trust the most in that rotation. Like you said, it's not a bad rotation. I think it's just like Logan Webb and then like three number three starters, but that's still a pretty big plus. Like even Del Scafani would probably be <laughs> the number two starter in a D back rotation. So I, I can only crap on them so much. So uh, <laughs> I, I can't really talk too bad about the Giants rotation, but I was going to talk to you about Chris Bryant, but I think I'm going to save that for our bigger discussion on MLB free agents. So let's just kind of segue to that, Ben, because I told you I was going to try to have you on here for like 35 minutes and we're already at 35 minutes and we haven't even talked free agents yet. So let's just segue right into it, Ben, because I lied to you. I said we wouldn't keep you that long and we're already going over. So MLB trade rumors, they came out with their top 50 free agents list and we're just looking at the top 10. Of the top 10, five of them were are already off the board. So we're just looking at the remaining top five free agents, according to MLB Trade Rumors. And we're going to start backwards, Ben, from the bottom. And the first name is Nick Castellanos, coming off a fantastic season with the Cincinnati Reds. MLB Trade Rumors is projecting maybe five years, $115 million deal. How do you feel about Castellanos? And where do you think is the best fit for him? Or what teams do you think might be interested in him after this lockout? Castellanos is an interesting guy because mm -hmm. he is so good offensively potentially and he, he showed that this year the short season he didn't do well but we can kind of write off the short season at this point I don't even Most, count that season a lot of I, weird performances that year yeah, I mean yeah. 60 games people do weird things in 60 games so and then of course all the weird protocols and everything that was going on but monster 2021 opts out of the remaining contract he was under with the reds and the thing is though the man is not a good defensive player <laughs> and it just like flat out has to be said he's just not a good defensive player and so how much value do you put on a guy who can be elite offensively but not but the opposite of elite defensively and so it's a big question for me and that mlb trade rumors prediction of a hundred and whatever, $15 million, I think is is hefty. And um, I guess I'll just say, I think the Marlins are kind of quietly a fit. I think they'd like to continue to improve their team. And he is a Miami native. And so they sometimes kind of randomly go out there and make an acquisition like this. But also uh, maybe possibly the Rangers who are trying to really improve their team this offseason. I think the best person to compare Castellanos to is probably a J.D. Martinez. So I'll ask you that, Ben. Do you feel like J.D. Martinez has been worth the money the last few years? Because he's basically, I think he got like a five-year, $120 million contract. He's basically the full-time DH for the Red Sox. But offensively, he's a beast. But defensively, he can't do crap. So Castellanos is probably going to get the same contract as a J.D. Martinez. So do you think J.D. Martinez has been worth the money that the Red Sox have paid him? Because that's probably going to tell the story for Castellanos. I think he has, but I also think that J.D. Martinez was more consistent. He mm, he was like consistently true. a monster, like a total monster, like one of the very best offensive players in the game year after year. And again, D-backs fans saw it firsthand when he was uh, acquired over there in a trade. But I mean, for a few years there, he was like 70% above average with, with, you know, hitting 330 with a 400 on base and 43 home runs. That's what he did in his first year in Boston and it's basically a replication of what he did in his in his year that he was partially with the D-backs. I don't think Nick Cassianos has been quite on that level. And so, but yeah, the other thing is JD Martinez has been a DH. And so, uh is Nick Cassianos trying to be an outfielder because different positions and if the I don't know. I I 
he's tough. He's a tough call because for me, he could be anywhere from kind of a low value guy to a hundred plus million dollar guy, depending on who you ask. Yeah, I feel like I would be okay with five years, a hundred million, if what we saw in twenty twenty one is what we're gonna get for the next few years. Because I don't think offensively he is as good as the JD Martinez. Because Martinez absolutely dominates the strike zone, getting on base, the power. JD Martinez, the whole package. Casianos has been pretty good throughout his career. I think his days in Detroit are kind of kind of underrated at this point. But what he's done in Cincinnati this past season is definitely a different level than what he did in Detroit. So I think the big question really is, are we going to get the universal DH after this CBA lockout? Because if we do, that's going to open up, what, 15 new suitors for Nick Castellanos that might, or at least a few new suitors if they're like, okay, now we just have to put him at DH. We don't really have to worry about his defensive liability issues. So uh, he's definitely an interesting guy. I think my prediction for Castellanos, though, is the Milwaukee Brewers, just because they lost Garcia to the Marlins, I believe. They also lost my guy, Eduardo Escobar, to the Mets. Christian Yelich hasn't really looked the same since, you know, getting those MVPs, those back-to-back MVPs. He hasn't really looked the same the last couple years. So I think they need some major juice in their lineup. I don't think, I, I really don't love their lineup offensively. From a pitching standpoint, they may have the best rotation in baseball. They have an elite bullpen, but their lineup, I think, needs a little bit more juice. So I think I like a Castellanos to the Milwaukee Brewers who desperately need some more offense. But Ben, next up on this list, I got Trevor Story written down. Projected six years, 126. Same question for Trevor Story. What teams do you think would be interested in him, in him or what teams do you think would be the best fit for Trevor Story? It's another tough call because he had a down year for yeah. the Rockies. And so uh, the six-year $126 million prediction, I'm just uh, – he might be one of those guys who ends up signing a much smaller deal than than what is predicted to kind of try to rebuild some value. I know for a fact he wants to get out of Colorado. That seems pretty apparent. So I think <laughs> he's happy to be a free agent and, and see what his options are. Again, I think the Rangers are a, are a fit. Uh, well, maybe not actually. Now that they've signed Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon, where the heck is would Story play? So, uh, I don't know. the The Phillies have have some issues in their in their in their team in general. I think they could use an infusion of of talent like that. I know they've got DD Gregorius at shortstop, but I think Trevor Story could possibly move around. For me. He's athletic enough where he could possibly play the outfield, and that would open up a lot of possibilities, especially if he was willing. He's a really good runner, which is kind of rare for a, a player who's also a really good shortstop. So I'm not sure. Any team, I think, could use a guy like that. Oh, yeah. If they consider him a guy who can play outfield, it just opens up so many different possibilities. Possibly the Astros if they lose out on Carlos Correa, which seems likely at this point. Yeah, and I love Trevor Story. I mean, I think he's listed at number eight on MLB Trade Rumors Top 50 Free Agents, and I might like him more than a Corey Seager or Carlos Correa because I don't care if he had a down season. I, I truly love the talent of a Trevor Story. I think he's shown enough from his past where he could be like a 320 hitter, 40-plus home runs, and the dude, like you said, he's a lot faster than people realize. Like, he led the league in stolen bases in 2020. He's been like a 30 stolen base guy before, and because of the wheels he has, I kind of like him to the – New York Yankees, who seem to be in the market for a shortstop. They love to get the power hitters. He just seems like a Yankee, and they also need the speed in their lineup. They just have a lot of plotters in their lineup. It's a big reason why they traded for Tim LaCastro from the D-back, just because they're like, freak it. We need anyone who can run and steal a base, so why not go after Tim LaCastro? And also, they got DJ LeMayu, a little coarse connection there, so why not go to the Yankees? I don't like it when the Yankees get anybody of that kind of talent, but I think it would probably be a good fit for Trevor Story, a big market. Could finally get out of cores, maybe get some recognition on his name as well. Put some respect on Trevor Story's name. So I guess I wouldn't mind seeing him go to the New York Yankees. But next up on the list, Ben, is your guy. Number four on MLB Trade Rumors Top 50 Free Agents, Chris Bryant. Projected six years, $160 million. Are the Giants bringing him back or are they just going to let him walk like a Kevin Gosman, Ben? I think ultimately they're going to let him walk like a Kevin Gosman. Wow. And it, it depends on what the contract ultimately is. I think it's really interesting. I looked at MLB Trade Rumors, ESPN, and Fangraphs. They all did top 50 lists. And I looked at them all. 
I wrote them all down and I averaged. Well, let's just say I looked at them all. And for Bryant, Fangraphs has him getting $200 million. Oh. MLB Trade Rumors, like you said, $160 million. ESPN has him at five years, $90 million. Whoa. So just a massive range here, $90 million to $200 million for Bryant. And I think Giants fans kind of saw this firsthand. He was great initially, but then he just kind of fell off a little bit and wasn't the superstar that people were hoping he would be. He was more good than great. And so if the cost is really eight years, $200 million, or even six years, $160 million, I personally, and then I think the Giants as well, don't necessarily see that as the correct value for a Chris Bryant. However, if his market kind of plummets and he really is in the you know five-year, $90 million range, I think at that point it becomes an intriguing value and you're getting a player with huge upside potentially. It's just, if you look at the numbers, like he was so good his first two, three years in the league and it, he just really hasn't quite been on that level or since. And so I don't know what you're going to get, especially like Fangraphs predicting an eight year deal. I, I just wouldn't feel comfortable with that given his size. He's not great defensively anywhere. He can play third, he can play the outfield, but none of them does he play particularly well. And Giants fans saw that as well. So if he's a first baseman or if he's a DH for you down the road, how much really do you want to invest, especially if the bat is in some decline? So there's there's definitely a question to me as to whether he comes back. Yeah, there's definitely some red flags with Chris Bryant. I think if you said eight years, that's probably too long for my liking because he is going to be 30 years old. And if it's over $160 million, I'm probably out on a Chris Bryant. That value is probably too much for me. If it's closer to 90 or 130 million, that might be okay over five years. But like you said, the last couple of years have just been kind of weird for Chris Bryant. The 2020 season, he only played 34 games. Again, 2020 was weird for a lot of players in baseball, but it was weird for him. 2021 was a big bounce back, but still, like you said, it wasn't as good of a season as we've seen in the past. And 2019 was pretty good, but wasn't as good as that season. So I don't like it when guys are kind of their career is moving in the opposite direction. That's why I feel like I'm more okay giving Castellanos a big contract, you know, a, a similar contract as opposed to Chris Bryant, just because Castellanos career seems to be going in an upward trajectory as opposed to Chris Bryant, who seems to be maybe going in a little bit of a decline. So I think there are some red flags there for Chris Bryant that makes me nervous, but if I had to pick a team for him, it might be the New York Mets because they were already in on him at the trade deadline. I feel like they usually gravitate toward players who can play multiple defensive positions, even if they're not great at it, like a Jonathan Villar. They like guys that can play second, first, third, outfield, like a Chris Bryant who can play multiple defensive positions. So I think the Mets would like him. He's also been an MVP. He's a champion. So he's got a little pedigree to him, too. The Mets don't have a lot of pedigree in that organization. So I can see a Chris Bryant going to New York Mets. But like you said, if the value is too much, if it's like, do I want to get Castellanos for $50 million less than a Chris Bryant? I might just do that deal. Like if they're both going to be similar type players, I could get one guy for $50 to $75 million less. Like you're saying like if if he gets close to that $200 million contract and Castellanos gets close to that $100 million contract, then like just give me Castellanos because I think on paper their production probably won't be much different even though Chris Bryant's got a little bit more versatility to him defensively so I, I think I would probably actually lean to a Castellanos over Chris Bryant because that contract just might be a lot cheaper than a Chris Bryant's but let's move on to the next guy here Ben we only got two guys less uh two guys left and the next one is Freddie Freeman who's projected a six-year $180 million deal. I'm actually surprised he's still a free agent. I thought he was, I, I didn't even consider him a free agent because I thought the Braves were going to lock him up as soon as that World Series ended. And here we are, lockout. He doesn't have a contract. So what are you expecting for Freddie Freeman? Do you actually believe he could leave Atlanta? I believe it now more than I did initially. Like you, I just thought uh, exact same reaction. He's just not even on the board. Forget yeah. about him. He's going back to Atlanta. Kind of a similar feeling with like a Clayton Kershaw. It's just like, and I thought Scherzer was going back to LA actually. So that was a relief to get him out of the division. But for Freddie Freeman, yeah. I mean, I think I would still say the odds are that he ends up back with Atlanta. 
But there there seems to be a legitimate shot, given that they couldn't get something done, despite, you know, he's been there forever. He grew up in the, in the area, grew up a Braves fan, and they win a World Series. And he's been their franchise player. It just seems like obvious that they will bring him back. But who knows? There are some teams that could use him. He's a really, really good player. And uh, I just don't know that the Braves are... I, I, I ultimately think the Braves will give him what he wants, but I think the Dodgers might be lurking there. Uh, actually, I do think he grew up in LA. I think I said he grew yeah. up... I think he grew up in LA now that I say that. Um, and then the Red Sox are a possible fit as well. So... We'll see, but I'm going with Atlanta until there's reason to believe otherwise. Yeah, I think he's going back to Atlanta. And even though he's going to be like 32 years old, like I would give him that six-year, $180 million deal because I think his production is a lot more bankable than a guy like Chris Bryant's. Plus, he's a pretty good defender, too. He's just been super consistent the last few years. I mean, 2021 was a little bit of a down season, I guess, if you compare it to like 2019, but he still had – crazy numbers like 30 plus bombs i'm looking at it uh 900 ops 300 average so i I feel pretty comfortable giving freddie freeman that kind of contract i do not want to go i do not want to see him go to the dodgers because f the dodgers that would be insane if they added a freddie freeman on top of everything else they already have so i feel like he has to go back to the braves like he's basically the face of their franchise like if they just let Freddie Freeman walk, I, I guess they maybe gave him a qualifying offer so they could get possibly a draft pick back. I'm not even sure if that's true, but they just let Freddie Freeman walk. Like, at least the Red Sox and the Rockies traded their franchise players. Like, if you just let him walk in free agency, especially if he goes to a team like the LA Dodgers, like, Atlanta's going to be in an uproar. We might see some Kurt Schilling riots happening in Atlanta. So, uh, that cannot happen if you are an Atlanta Braves fan. So, We'll see what happens with Freddie Freeman, but like you, I just can't believe this guy's actually going to uh, leave that city because he's been the heartbeat of that team for so many years. I just feel like he's a lifer there, but I think I would have said, you know, Mookie Betts is a lifer in a Red Sox uniform, and that didn't happen, so things change. So we'll see what happens with Freddie Freeman, but the last guy on the board, Ben, who I'm kind of surprised, maybe you could tell me if you agree that this guy should be the number one free agent, but Carlos Correa, I, I don't know if I actually feel like, I, I think he's a damn good baseball player, but do I think he's the best free agent on the market? I might actually lean to a Freddie Freeman or a Max Scherzer over a Carlos Correa, but he's projected 10 years, 320 million, whoever's going to give Carlos Correa the bag, uh, it's going to be very happy to get him, but they, they're also going to have him for a very long time. It might be an albatross by the end of it, so we'll see. But how do you feel about Carlos Correa? Do you think he's the best free agent on the market? And who do you think might be interested in him? I'm not sure that he's the best, only because of, for me, like the injury history. If you look at 2017, 2018, he only played around 110 games each of those years, and then 75 games in 2019. Uh, the last couple years have been healthy. Last year, though, wasn't a full season, so who knows what would have happened if it was. And so, if I'm giving you know ten years, three hundred plus million dollars to a player, I'd like ideally the player to have a long history of being healthy every year. So that concerns me a little bit, but the talent is undeniable. And the thing is, he's a really good defensive shortstop, ar- arguably one of the very best defensive shortstops in the game. And the man can just flat out hit. He he gets on base. He hits for power. He really does everything you could possibly want in the on a baseball field. The one thing is though the the cheating stuff, right? The Astros <laughs> sign stealing. We don't know exactly how much of the production was boosted by that, and so that's just something to keep in mind. I I probably would have had um, Corey Seager as a more desirable free agent but but also with Correa it has to be said he's he's only 27 and so that's part of why I think he's ranked as the top free agent in terms of fits I just for whatever reason tell me if I'm crazy I mean you have Trevor Story going there which I thought was a good call but I I just see Correa ultimately ending up with the Yankees but I think that the Phillies also make some sense I thought the Tigers made a ton of sense but they went out and got Baez. So I kind of am stumped on, on where he'll end up. It's hard to envision this 300 plus million dollar contract. Like who's going to give it out? Cause I think he will command that after Seeker signed for 325 mm-hmm. over 10 years. It's hard to argue that Correa is not worth 
about the same amount? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know who's going to give him. Maybe it's a dark horse team that we haven't even discussed. Maybe it's like maybe it's like one of those, you know, bottom feeder teams like the Rangers just did where they're like, "Hey, we could just go get this blue chipper and add him to our team and just have him for the next 10 years of his career and all of a sudden we at least got a building block for the future." So, we'll see what happens, but like you said, I wasn't really you know, too keen on his injury history before because I'm looking at his baseball reference right now. 2021 was the first time he played over 110 games since 2016. He's basically played 110 games or less over the last few years. So that's, of course, you got the 2020 season mixed in there. But 2019, 75 games, 2018, 110, 2017, 109. So basically you have to go back to 2016 was the last time he played a full season. So I think you definitely have to be concerned with his ability to stay on the field. But being 26, going to be 27 definitely helps. His numbers are pretty phenomenal. So I wonder who's going to go after him and give him that bag. A team that I feel like I like for him that doesn't, I, I don't think it's the best fit, but I could just see there being connection. It's the Red Sox for some reason. I don't know why. They, of course, already have Bogarts, but I feel like they might want to shift around that infield a little bit. Not, you know, move off of Bogarts or anything, but maybe eventually move Bogarts to third base and then Devers to DH because Devers just hasn't been a very good defensive player, even though I think he's one of the best offensive players in baseball defensively. There's a lot of struggles for him around the diamond. So I think eventually as JD Martinez gets a little bit older, he only has like a season or two left on his deal. Maybe once he leaves and moves on, move Devers to DH, move Bogarts to third and then could put Correa at shortstop or they kind of have a hole at second base too. Maybe you could work out something there. So that's just a wild dart at the dartboard. There's not really a fit there or need there for the Red Sox but I kind of just like that Correa to the Red Sox thing but if he goes to the Yankees like if he goes to any AL, AL East team especially the Red Sox Yankees like that would just be a big F you to the Astros especially after the sign stealing and after all that I mean I guess the Red Sox beat the Astros so maybe they don't have as much animosity toward them but if you're a Yankees fan if you get Carlos Correa like you're putting your middle finger up and you're gonna be feeling good about yourself after this offseason and lockout so Carlos Correa, all the guys we just mentioned, there are a lot of big names still on the market. And there's still a ton of names that we didn't talk about, like a Michael Conforto, who is going to be uh, who's going to be pretty valuable because he could be an all-star level outfielder, too, that might not break the bank for you. So there's still a ton of free agents on the market still. Are, are there any free agents on the market that we haven't mentioned today that you kind of like or have your eye on for the Giants? Uh, Seiya Suzuki is really intriguing, uh, being posted from Japan. I think he's kind of a great unknown, but yeah. he was the best player in Japan. And so I think there's there's some real intrigue. And I've heard a lot of uh, scouts say that he could be the best Japanese player since Hideki Matsui. And wow. so I'm intrigued by Seiya Suzuki, and he actually fits uh, something that the Giants are looking for, which is a right-handed outfielder. And you mentioned Michael Conforto as well and i think kyle schwarber is kind of an intriguing guy in some ways and uh and carlos rodan in the uh, starting rotation uh those are some of the guys but there are more there's there's still a lot of quality players left yeah this is gonna be a really good free agency hopefully after this lockout we'll see how much time is left before uh the season starts because by the time the lockout ends like it might be another scramble we might have you know, an off-season part two where everyone's scrambling and another free agent frenzy where everyone's trying to get signed before spring training because the lockout might end and it might be pitchers and catchers reporting the week after. So we'll see what happens with all this CBA stuff. There's going to be probably some rule changes. Probably the landscape of baseball is going to change a little bit. And after this off-season, like, there's going to be some big-time players switching hands. We've already seen it so far this offseason. So this is going to be one of the better baseball offseasons in recent history, maybe the best since, like, that Albert Pujols offseason. That's probably the last big offseason for baseball that sticks out in my mind, unless you have another one, Ben. But that's probably it for today, Ben. I mean, I've had you on here for an hour. I told you 30 minutes over our Twitter DMs, and we've just done double that. So I apologize for keeping you here 30 minutes today, but I greatly appreciate your time and hopping on the pod today, Ben. But for the people who are not watching the YouTube stream, Ben, where can they find you on social media? I'm uh, at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K, and then the show account at L-O underscore SF Giants. And like you always say, you can just search Locked on Giants and you'll find it. 
So, and what about for my listeners? Where where can they find you again? Yeah, I know you already said it, but say it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been going for an hour now, so they might yeah, have they forgot. forgot. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> at Creator Thomas twenty four for my personal account, or like Ben, just look up Locked On Dime back to my Twitter and Instagram. Even though I'm pretty inactive on Instagram, gotta do better there. Just look up Locked On Dime back to my Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. Ben Caspic, Locked On Giants. Thank you for hopping on the pod today, sir. Any last minute thoughts before we head out today? end the lockout i'm tired of it yeah. even though it's not going to end anytime soon but uh, but that's just that's what came to mind retweet that sentiment i think we're going to end this podcast perfectly after perfectly at one hour so ben caspic locked on giants miller thomas locked on diamondbacks crossover for the locked on podcast network thank you y'all and have a good night this is